probability density. So we said that psi was a wave function, and wave functions are the solutions to the uh, Schrodinger equation. Um, psi squared, then, is the probability density, which is the probability of finding an electron at a point in space. So it's the probability divided by the unit volume. And so depending on what L equals, whether 0, 1, 2, or 3, S, P, D, or F type of orbital, that specifies the shape of the orbital. So the S orbital is spherical. And the probability density decreases as the distance from the nucleus increases. When we plot these things, they resemble multiple exposure photography, little dots. What it's really important to understand is that the electron is not moving around the nucleus like a moth around a flame. Um, you could imagine that. You know, picture a light bulb and a moth and taking pictures of it over and over, and you see the moth here and here and here and here. And that time uh, multiple exposure thing would look similar, but that's not what the electron is doing. In a sense, the electron's location is spread out over the entire orbital because it's a wave and it's a particle at the same time. And if we, if we look at it, we force it to be a particle and we see it in one place, but we don't see its real behavior as a wave. So here is a representation of an S orbital. Um, Three-dimensional, it's a sphere, not just a flat circle. This can be a bit misleading because this implies that the largest density is going to be right at the nucleus, and we know that that's not true. The electron is not found in the nucleus. If we graph the probability density versus the distance from the, rate, um, from the nucleus, we see that the highest probability is at the nucleus, and that, that's not right. So what's more accurate is the radial distribution function. And this looks at the total probability of finding an electron in a thin spherical shell at a distance r from the nucleus. So um, kind of like layers of an onion. Well, what's the chance of it being in this layer of onion skin? And what's the chance of it being in the next layer of the onion skin and the next layer of the onion skin? And as you get bigger and bigger, farther and farther out, the onion layer gets larger in volume. So this gives us a much better picture. The radial probability is the probability divided by the unit volume. So that was what we saw before, times the volume of the shell. And we have opposite trends here. Psi squared has a maximum at the nucleus and decreases with R. The volume of the thin shell is zero at the nucleus and increases with R. And so this gives us a better result. Here, the probability of the electron being at the nucleus is zero. It rises sharply to a maximum at a radius of 52.9 picometers from the nucleus, and then it falls off again. So for hydrogen, in that 1s orbital, the predicted average distance from the nucleus, or most probable distance, is 52.9 picometers. And the Bohr model predicts the same distance. But there's a very important conceptual difference. In the Bohr model, the electron is orbiting the nucleus like the Earth orbits the sun. And so that electron is always at 52.9 picometers. In quantum mechanics, the electron is found at many different radii, but 52.9 is just the most probable. That's where it's most likely to be, but it is not necessarily there. So what about the 2s and 3s orbitals? Well, they are also spherical. They're larger in size than the 1s, and they contain at least one node. So here's an illustration of, of a wave, a standing wave. And I'll show you a video, too. If you get a standing wave forming, um, here you have the wave constructively interfering with itself, and here it's destructively interfering. And so this is called a node. If this were a string vibrating, 
it doesn't move at all here. And it doesn't move here, and it doesn't move here. Those are nodes. The wave function goes through zero. So with these larger 2s and 3s orbitals, the 2s orbital has one node besides the nucleus, and the 3s has two nodes. And so there are two positions where the probability of finding the nucleus and finding the electron is zero. So if we look at a side cutout view of the 2s and 3s orbitals, here is the node. Um, and this 3s orbital has two nodes. If we look at the... Um, it's too small to read. The total radial probability. We see this little bump here and a node, and then this larger bump. And so the most probable distance is here. And for the 3s, then we have two nodes. So let's look at that video. So because this is a wave function, because the electron has wave properties, it can have nodes, just like that string did with the waves on the string. There are positions where there's no movement. There are positions where there's no possibility of the electron being there. It can be, it can be in here, it can be out there, it can be over here, but it can't be in here. As a wave, it is present in all three of those regions, like we saw the wave on the string. It's not just in one side or the other, it's everywhere. And so because of its wave properties, the electron is, in, in essence, everywhere within that region. It's only when we observe it and force it to act like a particle that we see, well, it can only be in one place at a time. Does that make any sense? A little bit, maybe. Each principal energy level, n equals 1, n equals 2, is going to have one s orbital. And this is the lowest energy orbital in that principal energy state. It's spherical. And the number of nodes that it has is equal to n minus 1. So the one s orbital doesn't have a node because n is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, there are 0 nodes. n equals 2, it has 1 node, n equals 3 has 2 nodes. The next quantum number, L, L equals 1, is the p orbital. And we looked at this before. m sub L has values from minus L to plus L, and so there's three different p orbitals, and their difference is orientation in space. They're oriented along a different axis. Axis. So there's P along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. These guys have two lobes, and so they look a lot more like a standing wave. They have one node at the nucleus, and then depending on the principal energy level, they will also have other nodes. So here is... Um, one of the p orbitals lined up along the x-axis, another one is along the y-axis, and another is along the z-axis. These all three have the same energy, but they're oriented differently in space. And so you can kind of envision this like a standing wave, right? There's a standing wave, and then when it's all blurred together, we see it going the other direction as well. And so for this um, 2p orbital, there's the node at the nucleus, and then there's not another node, but the probability increases and then falls off again. In the d orbitals, we have five possible values of m sub l, and so we have five different d orbitals. And these are also, they vary in orientation. Four of them are aligned in different planes, and then the fifth one is aligned with the z-axis. Most of these are four-lobed. Um, one of them is just bizarre. It's the two lobes with a toroid. It's like a, got a floaty around its waist. And these have planar nodes. And this is, you know, things are just getting weirder. 
Um, so the d orbitals tend to look kind of like a double p orbital. And the nodes here are planar. There's one here and there's one here. And then, so this one's along the xy, I'm sorry, yz. This is along the xy, so this is um, flat, horizontal. This is vertical, and this is horizontal but at an angle. And then there's this guy who doesn't look like the others. But this is what you get when you solve these functions. That's weird. The f orbitals are even stranger. Now we have seven different orbitals because m sub l can go from minus 3 all the way up to plus 3. Most of these are 8 lobed, but some of them are 2 lobed with a toroid. And these also have planar nodes. The higher the principal energy level, the more nodes you have, and some of these have spherical nodes. So those are pictures of the f orbitals. Looks like very bizarre balloon art. Yes? Um, yes, thank you. That is F, because we're talking about F orbitals. Thank you very much. So these guys just really bizarre shapes. So we find these weird shapes from the wave function. And like the wave with the string, you can have a positive or a negative value. There's this axis, and the string is going above or below, and at the node, it's zero. So the, the node is where the wave function equals zero. If it's, a, if it's positive or negative, that's the phase of the wave. And waves can be in phase or out of phase, positive or negative. So when they interact, they can constructively or destructively interfere. So is a node like electron diffraction? A node is a place where the probability of the electron being there is essentially zero. We don't see diffraction um, with electrons within an atom. When we shoot electrons through a slit is when we see diffraction, just like with light. We don't see diffraction just unobstructed light. But when it goes through two slits and we cause it to bend, then we see that interference pattern. And this idea of these wave functions interacting in phase and out of phase has a lot to do with bonding between atoms. So if we look at um, the s orbital, the s orbital doesn't have a node. The 1s orbital doesn't have a node. So it's going to be positive. The 2p orbital has a node. And so on one side, the phase is positive. On the other side, the phase is negative. So in the illustrations, a lot of times they'll um, use blue to indicate positive and red to indicate negative. Well, with all these wacky balloon shapes for the places where the electrons are likely to be, why do we think of atoms as being spherical? Because when you combine or superimpose all these different orbitals, it comes out to be a roughly spherical thing. So this is you know, an illustration of that. We take all these different orbitals, and they're all on top of each other, centered on the nucleus. And overall, it's a roughly spherical shape. Yay. That's a hard